A turbocharged Piper Arrow departs into the night with a simple, familiar plan. There is no mechanical problem reported before departure. There is no emergency driving the schedule. There is no indication that the flight is expected to be difficult. And yet, only minutes later, the aircraft is descending rapidly, accelerating far beyond its normal operating range and tightening into a spiral from which recovery never occurs. The NTSB's final report gives us a clear picture of how the aircraft was lost. But accidents like this are rarely decided in the final moments. Today, we are going to step back and examine how the conditions and decisions before takeoff quietly shaped a situation where, once things began to go wrong, there was very little room left to fix them. To understand any aviation accident, we need to begin with the people involved. Not to assign blame, but to understand context. The pilot was Charles Chad Wayne Garland, 55 years old. He held a student pilot certificate. The passenger was Marjorie Ann Garland, 74 years old. She was his mother. This relationship matters, not because of emotion, but because it influences how decisions are made. Aviation decisions are shaped by expectations, perceived responsibility, and subtle pressure. These factors are not written on checklists, but they are present in every cockpit. Flying with a family member can introduce a quiet obligation to complete the flight as planned. There may be reluctance to delay, cancel, or turn back. There may also be a desire to demonstrate capability and confidence. None of this requires conscious risk-taking. Often, it simply shifts where a pilot draws the line. There is also an important regulatory context. Under FAA regulations, a student pilot may not act as pilot in command while carrying a passenger. This limitation exists because student pilots are still developing the skills and judgment needed to manage complex or rapidly changing situations. Training flights are meant to occur within a carefully controlled environment, where errors can be corrected before they escalate. Once a passenger is added, especially a family member, the nature of the flight changes. The safety structure provided by the training system is no longer fully in place. The flight becomes a personal mission rather than a supervised learning exercise. This does not mean an accident is inevitable, but it does mean that if conditions deteriorate, the number of protective layers available to catch an error is reduced. That reduction in margin is subtle, but it is significant. With that context in mind, let's look at the environment this flight was launched into. The aircraft departed at night. Weather along the route was deteriorating. Instrument meteorological conditions were present or developing. These elements are clearly established in the NTSB's final report. Night flying increases workload even in good weather. Visual references are reduced, depth perception is limited, and the horizon can be difficult to identify. Small attitude changes that are obvious during the day can become almost imperceptible at night. When weather is added to that environment, the margin narrows further. Clouds remove outside visual references entirely. Once an aircraft enters them, the pilot must rely exclusively on flight instruments to maintain control. There is no gradual transition. Visual flying ends abruptly. For an experienced, instrument-rated pilot, this situation already demands conservative planning. Weather trends must be understood, escape options preserved, and personal limits respected. For a student pilot, the challenge is more fundamental. Instrument flying is not simply about reading gauges, it is about trusting them instinctively even when the body strongly disagrees. That trust is developed through structured training and repeated exposure. Without it, the pilot may still know what the instruments say, but may not yet have the reflex to believe them over physical sensation. At night, the visual system provides fewer cues to contradict those sensations. In cloud, it provides none. This is where decision-making becomes critical. Once airborne at night, turning back becomes psychologically more difficult. After departure, there is often a natural tendency to continue, especially if the weather ahead does not appear dramatically worse than expected. But weather does not need to be dramatic to be dangerous. It only needs to remove visual reference. At this stage, the flight environment begins to demand skills that exceed visual flying alone. Any deviation from stable flight now must be corrected using instruments only. 
There is no outside reference to confirm whether the correction is working. There is no visual horizon to stabilize against. This is not a gradual increase in difficulty. It is a threshold. Once that threshold is crossed, the pilot must either fly the aircraft precisely by instruments or risk losing control. And importantly, this transition does not come with a warning. From the cockpit, the environment may initially feel manageable. The airplane is still flying normally. The engine is producing power. Nothing appears broken. But the safety margin is now extremely thin. By the time the aircraft is fully dependent on instrument flying, the decisions made earlier have already defined what options remain. And that is where the trajectory of this accident was quietly set. When pilots hear the phrase VFR into IMC, it is often treated as a single mistake. In reality, it is a process, a gradual transition from a controllable situation into one that becomes increasingly unforgiving. The first thing that fails is not control of the aircraft. It is trust in accurate information. Inside cloud, the visual system goes quiet. The brain immediately looks for another reference. That reference becomes the vestibular system, the inner ear. On the ground, this system works well. In flight, it does not. The inner ear senses acceleration, not speed or attitude. In a sustained turn, it eventually stops detecting rotation and signals the brain that the aircraft is straight and level, even when it is not. When the turn is corrected, the sensation reverses, creating the powerful illusion that the aircraft is now banking in the opposite direction. These sensations are not weak. They are convincing, persistent, and extremely difficult to ignore without training. The NTSB data shows that after the aircraft entered instrument conditions, the flight path became increasingly unstable. This was not a single abrupt maneuver. It was a series of small deviations that gradually compounded. That detail matters, because it tells us the pilot was likely trying to maintain control, not abandoning it. Each correction was probably made with good intent, trying to stabilize altitude, heading, or attitude. But without reliable visual cues and without ingrained instrument discipline, each correction carried the risk of reinforcing the wrong control input. This is why pilots who are not instrument rated often describe the experience as confusing rather than frightening. The airplane still responds. Nothing appears broken. The instruments are available, but they may conflict with bodily sensation. At this stage, the workload increases dramatically. The pilot must now interpret instruments continuously, cross-check for errors, suppress false sensory input, all while flying an aircraft that is gradually departing from stable flight. This is not a failure of intelligence. It is a mismatch between human physiology and the flight environment. Once this mismatch exists, the timeline compresses rapidly. As orientation degrades, the aircraft enters a spiral dive, often without the pilot immediately recognizing it as such. A spiral is especially dangerous because it does not announce itself clearly. The aircraft is not stalled. The wings are flying. The controls feel effective. From the pilot's perspective, the airplane still works. But aerodynamically, the situation is changing in a very specific way. As bank angle increases, the lift vector tilts, Less lift is available to oppose gravity. The aircraft begins to descend. The pilot may instinctively apply back pressure to stop the descent, increasing load factor. This has two critical effects. First, stall speed increases. Second, drag increases, causing the nose to drop further. As the nose drops, airspeed builds rapidly. The NTSB's performance analysis shows that airspeed increased dramatically during this phase eventually exceeding the aircraft's never exceed speed. This is not unusual in spiral accidents, but it is always consequential. Once airspeed increases beyond design limits, control forces rise significantly. Pulling out of the spiral now requires more physical force, more altitude, and more precise coordination. At the same time, descent rate continues to increase. Altitude becomes the limiting resource. In training environments, spiral recoveries are taught with thousands of feet available. In real-world accidents, especially those that begin shortly after departure, that altitude simply does not exist. 
Another factor often overlooked is cognitive narrowing. As workload increases, attention narrows. The pilot may focus on one parameter, such as altitude, while losing awareness of airspeed or bank angle. This narrowing is not a choice. It is a natural response to overload. By the time the spiral is fully developed, the aircraft is consuming altitude faster than the pilot can process information. Even if recognition occurs, the physical and aerodynamic requirements for recovery may already exceed what is available. At that point, the outcome is no longer influenced by intention or effort. It is governed by physics. The NTSB's probable cause statement accurately describes the final link in the chain, but focusing only on the last link risks missing the broader lesson. This accident was not caused by one decision. It was caused by a sequence of decisions that interacted with each other. Each decision made sense in isolation. Together, they formed a closed system. Accepting responsibility for a passenger changed the psychological context of the flight. Continuing into night conditions reduced visual margins. Proceeding toward deteriorating weather removed escape options. Each step narrowed the range of outcomes. By the time the aircraft entered cloud, the flight required immediate, confident instrument flying. That requirement did not appear suddenly. It was the predictable result of earlier choices. At that moment, the pilot no longer had flexibility. There was no room for gradual correction, experimentation, or hesitation. This is an important distinction. Many accidents are described as loss of control, but loss of control is often the symptom, not the cause. The cause lies in how much margin was available when control began to degrade. In this case, that margin was already extremely thin. Once spatial disorientation began, the aircraft's response followed known aerodynamic principles. The pilot's physiological response followed known human limitations. Nothing unusual had to happen for the outcome to be fatal. Everything unfolded exactly as decades of accident data predict. This accident was not about recklessness or intent. It was about how quickly a flight can move beyond the boundaries of training and experience when small decisions accumulate. Aviation safety is built on margins, visual margin, performance margin, cognitive margin. When those margins are reduced simultaneously, recovery options disappear. The most important lesson here is not about spiral dynamics or instrument interpretation. It is about recognizing when a flight's demands exceed current capability. Because once that threshold is crossed, the airplane does not care why. The safest decision is often the one that prevents the chain from starting at all, on the ground, before the engine ever turns.